There's two ways to be uber successful. Deep confidence, deep insecurity. My happiness is completely based on simplicity. 12 people that I'm most infatuated with and love with, healthy. I'm driven by the gratitude of my perspective and I do want to scale it. All of my happiness is predicated on my humility. I don't think I'm special. I try to be great, but deep down, I don't have to keep up a facade. Content, happy, at peace. All of those three things are way better than a verified account with tens of millions of followers, way better than tens of millions of dollars in a bank account, way better than any of that This concept that we're like trying to like get validation from others is really hurting people. I'm trying my best, my intent is there, some things are gonna work and some things aren't. I'm completely convinced that there's so much more happiness and simplicity. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because in my first business, I quit on my business partner, I struggled to keep going, I was making 300 bucks a month and felt like a complete failure. And the thing that saved me, that pulled me up, was studying the stories of famous entrepreneurs. I got the motivation from them. I also got the strategies of what to do next so that I can go off and achieve my dreams. And quite honestly, I still need the stories today myself to continue my motivation to take it to the next level. So today let's learn from one of the best, Gary Vaynerchuk, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is practice humility. Once you fall in love with humility, you have a chance of being happy. Yeah. And so, you know, humility is not at the expense of confidence and ambition. I'm all sorts of confident and ambitious. I also have the humility to realize I'm not special. <laughs> I also have the humility and the, and the self-confidence to not need outside affirmation and so, you know, when I hear you start this conversation in the context of mortgage professionals who made a ton of money and right now aren't, like I don't, I struggle with the heavy negativity being a financial situation. Yeah. Because if you crushed the last two years, you seemingly have the opportunity to eat a lot of humble pie and reset, including, well Gary, I didn't buy a house. Yeah. And so I can't down trade. I bought a lot of stuff. Well, Absolutely. Sell your stuff. Like, if you bought an $8,000 handbag, <laughs> that sell in handbag. hindsight you wish you had 8,000, sell it for 6,700 on eBay. Yep. People want their cake and eat it too. And that's why they have issues. I say lean into you know accountability yeah. and address the situation. Rule number three is learn to save money. What are your thoughts on the economy right now and how an ambitious, business owner should navigate that, especially a contractor. Yeah, I'm not an economist, so I'm not, I'm coming from a complete guess. What do I feel? I feel that there's just a lot of instability in the world, right? There's, there's war in Europe, there's a huge shift in the way the world communicates between social and traditional media. There's clearly a East versus West scenario between China and America that continues to get more strategic, if not contentious. You know, you've got alliances, BRICS, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa um, is a real economic alliance now that is something that the US and Europe can't ignore. That leads to like different actions, different instabilities. Um, I think that there is incredible lack of people saving money. You know, the coolness of saving money of the 50s and 60s has become not cool. People live on credit. People buy things they can't afford. So that's always scary. I would say an ambitious small business should make sure that they have a just encased fund. So like don't overextend yourself. Be sitting on cash to the best of your ability. A little a little nest egg. But don't be frozen by fear. Like, be on the offense if you're good. Like, if you're good, you'll pick up business during tough times because your competitors will lose their business to you. Rule number four is create demand. What strategies would you implement for small businesses in this down market? The answer I just gave earlier. Like, literally a headline I was thinking about green screening yesterday was about how a TikToker did one review of a restaurant and the restaurant was on the verge of bankruptcy and now it's quadrupled in sales. You know, I kind of put the alpha in something yesterday or the day before. I'm writing jab, 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 left hook. 
right? And it's because jab, 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 right hook still gets emails every day from small businesses and entrepreneurs that it's helping them. And I wrote it seven, eight years ago that the strategies are not as good as what I can tell you now about doing a green screen and why or LinkedIn that. So um, small businesses need to create demand. Demand comes from marketing. Organic reach and social is the best way a small business can do marketing because you're able to get awareness and not have to pay for it. You can't put a full page ad in a newspaper and not pay for it. You can't run a commercial on TV and not pay for it. You can't buy an outdoor billboard and not pay for it. You can't run an audio ad on a radio station or a podcast and not pay for it. Everybody on the algorithms and these platforms. You can open an account on Instagram, TikTok, or LinkedIn right now, post something, pay nothing for the distribution, and change your life. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is be a great leader. I really do feel a tremendous sense of responsibility. I genuinely sit here this morning looking at all of you and my chemicals and my emotions are, I work for them. What I just wanna say is thank you because I think we've all worked extremely hard this year. I genuinely believe that. Hard is something we'll always do because I just know the makeup of this team. There's a lot of people that roll that way here. We have benefited from this and I know a lot of you have felt this and I've heard this from a lot of you, especially for the OGs here, more so than in a long time. I think we had a very clear focus. The way I look at everybody here is the way I look at leadership in general, parenting, being a president. We have no room in any shape or form, in any situation to not treat each other or anybody that we interact with with anything other than super glee, joyful, deep love, optimism, rainbows, and unicorns. Here's why, because that's what I do for you. This is very important to me. We are at our worst when the delta between how I treat you is different than how you treat anybody you interact with. Since I don't manage you with fear or negativity, why on earth would we? And by the way, this almost makes me wanna cry. The amount of issues we have on this issue here is quite low. When I say this, please let everyone know that it's almost non-existent. I want it to be zero. Rule number six is ignore what others think. Do you have any advice of like how to like start conversations, like how to like just get better at like making connections? And the only way to get better at networking is realizing why you're scared of people's judgment. It's it's something I deal with like my whole it's life. It's not about a technique. It's why do you actually yeah. worry that if Dustin, you come up to him and want to network yeah. him and he's like no, why does that make you feel bad? Yeah. You need to figure that out. Exactly. That's why. Let me give you the it. secret. Yeah. It doesn't matter. If you can remember that moment and realize all of them are Dustin, yeah. it's not like you really, it's like don't value someone's opinion about you more than the value that you put on yourself about you. I know, I got to, I got to do so, that. So start practicing. What happens next? Uh-huh. You practice. Okay. You like really practice. Yeah. You just go and actually network. And just do it. And like feel the pain and the awkwardness uh-huh. until it's gone. Rule number seven is stop making excuses. How do you succeed in doing videos on things you know are passionate if somebody else is already in and succeeding at it? Nobody else's winning is coming out of yours. (laughs) If that was true, the game was over a long time ago. That's right. Why did LeBron try to pass Kareem? Oh, that's good. Kareem was the all-time leading scorer. Yeah. Like, why is Kevin Hart doing that? Eddie Murphy did that already, but why did Eddie Murphy do that? Richard Pryor already did that. What are we talking about here? This con, excuses like that, and notice the word I used, excuses like that, are just people that are scared to do the thing and fail on merit. They feel better that somebody already took it. The world is abundant. If you're good enough, no matter how much is already taken, you can get yours too. I wasn't the first person to talk about kindness. I was the first person (laughs) to talk about work. I wasn't the first person to talk about technology. That is a ludicrous point of view and I come from a place of compassion when I use that statement. 
that person needs to realize that's a subconscious excuse to not do. Yeah. And it's better to blame that, oh, they didn't get lucky, somebody already did it, versus them having to put in the work to do it. Rule number eight is have self-awareness. If you could give one piece of advice as far as a step in the right direction for people that are ready to stop working and get into entrepreneurship, where do, where do you start? You start by first being self-aware. A lot of people actually aren't gonna be good at entrepreneurship. They just might need a job that they like more. Almost nobody likes their job. The stunning majority are dislike or at best neutral about it. They're not on fire. They're not waking up on Monday like let's go. And so to me LinkedIn, no different than you listening to one piece of content for me that changed the course for you because you figured out this. For somebody right now who's watching this, if they realize that they can post things about their opinions, their observations and their expertise about what they do for a living. If you're a five-year lawyer and you say, something I'm seeing in law around IP law, and you write four sentences, you make a video, it depends on how you communicate, written word or video. Right, right. One piece of content on LinkedIn where you have no followers right now can change the course of your life because now you have inbound people offering you jobs instead of you sitting and dwelling about hating your job. And after six months to a year, there's a piece of content that's gonna come out that's gonna lead to the next job opportunity. That's what I think people should do. Rule number nine is speed up the micro. If someone's never heard the you know, slow down the macro, speed up the micro, what does that mean? Expand that for a second. Your day to day, like, you know, I don't know, like we're gonna do this together in real time because I like jamming with you. Like, <laughs> like you, you, you even laughed a little bit. Julian's uh, fooling me around, like something that was like a five minute transition. Like this is my calendar. Yeah. Like it's constant. Yeah. And by the way, this is, look at these meetings. Just, <laughs> what does that say? 11 to 11.05. Five minute meeting, 11.05 yeah. to 11.30, 11.30 to 11.45, <laughs> 11.45 to 12, 12.05 to 12.15, 12.15 to 12.30. I did, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30. <laughs> I did 15 me meetings before 1 p.m. today. Okay, so the reason this is- I did 15 <laughs> meetings, so that's speed up your micro. Your day to day, go way faster, be way more efficient. But macro, I'm not in a rush to, Buy the New York yeah. Jets. I love my process. I'm not in a rush to buy a Lambo or a house. <laughs> like everyone needs to really, 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 really speed up their day to day, yeah. but slow their skis on their big goals. Enjoy the process. Don't rush to get the trophy. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is focus on your passion. How do you find like your passion in life and what's your like, you know, advice for people to find it? Like passion, mission in life? So I think, I think people are, struggle with passion because they overthink the financial part of it. So a lot of people's passion is cooking or video games or gardening or watching movies. But their brain says, I can't build a business watching movies. Oh, so you think like it's always like end up building a business, right? Yeah, because when people ask me, Gary, what's my passion? They're really asking me, Gary, what can I make money on that I also like? And I, right? And I say that what happens is people over-rationalize the business part. But if you actually focus on the passion part for real, I love Star Wars, I love Legos, I love skateboarding, that then when you take a stick back with content and everything now, podcasts, TikTok, blogs, you can make anything a business, anything. But you need to have a thing which you like to do, right? I believe that the reason you have to fo focus on your passion is if you love it, it doesn't feel like work. And if it doesn't feel like work, you can do it 10, 12 hours a day, which is what's required to give a business by yourself a chance to succeed. You can't nine to five yourself to a 1% life. How did you develop a healthy relationship with time, Gary? That's my question. I hung out with 80 year olds when I was a kid. I gravitated towards grandparents and great grandparents um, from a very young age. My best friend when we first came to America because we were poor and everybody was working was my great grandfather. Um, he passed unfortunately a year into being in America but I have always gravitated towards them and what you learn when you spend time with 80 year olds. If I could tell anybody anything here, Spend time with an 80 year old that is not your grandparent. Just have a combo, a dinner, uh, strike up a conversation. To this day, the only people I strike up conversations with at airports are people that I think look like Yoda. 
Like are they 90? I wanna talk to them. Uh, Because they've lived it, they give you context, and I'm practical. Like you're 36 KP, right? Like think about this. Think about, think about uh, 15 years ago when you were 21. You probably remember your 21st birthday, right? Yep, yep, yep. It feels like yesterday and it feels like seven trillion years ago, right? True. Right? So if you think about those 15 years, you can think about how much you've accomplished, how much opportunity you had, whether you accomplished it or not, how many reps, how many at-bats, how much time that actually is. Now, what I do is when I'm 36 and I do that 15 thing, then I go, in 15 years I'll be 51. When you hang out with older people, you realize 51's a child. I have unlimited 50, 60, and 70 year old friends who act no different than my 30 year old friends. And so a lot of you see me publicly going deep into youth culture. I love the kids, I love the Gen Zers, the young millennials, Um, but I spend a lot of my not public time with 60, 70, 80 year olds and it's context. And that context allows me to understand. My life is happy because I think everything in my life is my fault, all of it. It is the most liberating truth of all time. Of course I'm logically understanding that there's other people, that there's other variables, that there's things I don't control, but I'm completely in control to what I do. You are capable of doing anything. You are capable of firing your employees. You are capable of breaking up in your relationship. You are capable of moving to another town, another country. You are capable of selling your home. You are capable of all of it, but we don't like that. We like to blame all our problems on Putin. Bad day at home? Facebook. The algorithm and the dictators are not impacting your day to day anywhere close to what you've decided your lack of accountability is dictating. This is a very focal point of the conversation. We must understand this. Everything you talk about, gratitude, empathy, kindness, all things that I live on, They all come from me thinking everything's my fault. They all come from me knowing I have control. Everybody, when they get into the accountability and control game, immediately, much of this audience, starts thinking to the counterpoint. They immediately start thinking to the counterpoint. The natural human spirit for most people, when told everything is your fault, you are in control of everything, will start giving you 800 answers to why that's not true for them. And that's how they're missing the point. When I brought up earlier, sell, if you are tight on money and you own a home, sell your home and live in a your home. Do you know how many people do that on earth? No one. Do you know how logical what I just said is? You are tight on cash, you are really struggling. You own a fairly nice home and your mortgage situation, you have an asset and you will not sell it to live in a lesser home because you worry about what people think about that move. My favorite chess move to this debate is like, but Gary, I can't do that to my kids. My counterpoint is, that's the best you can do for your kids. So the world's currency of humanity is predicated on using fear as a weapon, and that starts at home. The reason we're conducive to it, to politicians, is because our parents deployed it from the beginning. Then, You're speaking to a dad, so I'm hearing you. Brother, this has got me going like you can't imagine. I am the byproduct of a mother who It's so emotional for me, it's like tough to even talk about publicly. I'm literally writing a book called Perfectly Parented. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, I could sit here for six hours and tell you what my parents did wrong, but they so did right on accountability and and loving and cheering for the right things. My, My mother didn't, she punished me for bad grades, but there was never a day where I thought my self worth was tied into my schoolwork. Mm-hmm. My self-worth was tied into the things she cheered about and made important, which was how I treated other human beings. Mm-hmm. When, uh, I mean, these are real stories of my life. When somebody would fall and trip and be hurt, 
one, we were playing in the 80s, nobody thought about any of these feelings and ideas, and I would stop playing and I would run over and care about the kid, that's the story my mom would talk about over dinner, right? When, when I would stand up for the kid that was getting picked on, that's what my mom, not my parents overvalue grades, which teaches kids to believe in systems that grade you subjectively every 100 days, Parents overvalue other parents' opinion of their kids, which teaches kids to value other people's opinions. Parents use fear to stop kids from doing things that they're scared of. I'm scared shitless of dogs and water, this is real. I, Gary, at 46, deep down, am not super comfortable around dogs, and I fear the water. Why? Because my mom did. Mm. And it's one of the few things I have fear around because it's one of the few things that my mom instilled fear around. If you fear getting a B, you will work for a company your whole life. We yeah. need a, you know, this is not face, I love when everyone's like, Zucks, Zucks my asshole. People want to blame the algorithm, social media, politicians, governments. We have no level of accountability. Parents on technology all day long, and then the second that they're having a good time drinking wine, they give the iPad to the kid because they don't want to be bothered. Mm. Parents' hypocrisy at scale, parents being way too involved in their kids, thus overprotecting them, thus telling children that they don't trust them to be able to handle their own has led to the moment we are in. And until we accept that truth, until the older millennials, Gen Xers, or boomers that shit on Gen Z when they're the ones who parented them, until they become ex- accountable for their shortcomings, and until we teach Gen Zers, don't do what we did, play it different, we'll just have a perpetual machine of insecurity. The mainstream media and social media are doing a phenomenal job of talking about negativity and what's wrong, just so everybody knows, fear sells. Most of the parents in this room use fear to control what they want their kids to do. It's how, it's how humans are wired. The problem for me is I got lucky in the DNA game and I have the greatest mom in the world and a lot of great circumstances that made me the reverse. I look at everything I just talked about, like if I'm sitting in this crowd listening to this, I'm pumped, I wanna run through a wall and like take everyone's money. If you tweak your perspective on how the world's operating, and instead of buying into the propaganda for control of your mind, you look at the optimism that these tools can create for you, if all of a sudden you look at your employees like your teammates, literally, I'm so affected by this. If you look at your employees, I have 2,000 employees at VaynerMedia alone. I genuinely think I work for them. I swear on my children's health. I work for them. Of course you do. If you're a great leader and you want to build something meaningful, you work for them. I was raised by a dad who taught me the reverse. That's why I know the difference. And I used to be mad at my dad, but then I got kind of like a little bit older and realized my dad grew up in the Soviet Union where the country controlled everything and the employees stole everything. The whole country ran on the black market. Literally, this is the first, oh, I'm so pumped I mentioned earlier. So it's my birthday and I'm going to the liquor store and I'm super sad. No, it's not my birthday today. I'm going back to the story. But it was my birthday a couple weeks ago, so if you want to clap it up, I'll take it. So it's my 14th birthday, I'm driving to the liquor store. As you may be able to tell by the way I'm talking, I talk all the time. My dad does not talk. We were completely the opposite. We live 45 minutes from the liquor store because my dad wanted to have land because he likes cows and pigs and shit. So we're 45 minutes from the liquor store, driving on Route 78 in New Jersey to the liquor store. My dad says no words. I'm talking a mile a minute, like I'm coming in dad, and like wait till you see what I got, I'm gonna sell every bottle of wine. Like I'm like hyped, even, you know, like I was, I didn't realize I was gonna get paid two bucks an hour at this point. (laughs) We pull up to the store after 45 minutes, he says not one word, he turns to me and he goes, Keep an eye on the employees. They like to steal. That's what my dad taught me. I grew up in that environment. I I grew up in an environment where I watched an owner be in conflict 
with his employees. And then I've run businesses for 25 years where I've done the reverse. I'm an investor in over 500 companies and watch closely, I'm on tons of boards, I'm watching, this is my passion. If you cannot deploy empathy and compassion for your employees, I once said something to my dad, he brought it up this weekend actually. I said, Dad, if everybody who worked for you was you, they wouldn't work for you. I tell a lot of my friends who struggle with their employees, I'm like, I had a buddy who's like, I just want them to work as hard as me. I'm like, then give them equity in the business, equal to you. We have to reframe this conversation. You have to make it enjoyable and interesting, not because you're soft, but because you want to make money. Do you know why people are not nice? Because they do. They're grasping at straws. They're, they've caught a tiger by the tail and have a relationship with a nice person or they have a nice boss. They're scared every single day for that person to leave because that person is the energy of balance because they themselves are super hurt inside. They're hurt because they haven't put the poison into the world. They've demonized therapy so they don't do that. If they've done that, they definitely don't tell normal people. They peacock and hide behind money, behind status, behind things. My friends, the world is this close. The reason it feels so far away is occasionally people come around and realize how much fear works, how much demonizing others works. It makes people feel safe for a second. It is the least sustainable thing in the world. It is the least sustainable thing in the world. You know how I know this? I was an atrocious student, but there was one class I was always good at, history. I never understood why, and then finally in my 30s, I realized, oh, because my entrepreneurial spirit knew that I would need it to recognize pattern recognition. Today, many people on me or laugh at me because I believe in NFTs. In a decade, in a decade, in a decade, I'm gonna laugh at them. You know how I know this? History. In 1996, I told anybody that would listen to me that the internet was a very good thing. In 1999, when the stock market crashed, everybody said the internet was a fad. In 2005, in 2007, I was in Germany three times for three different talks, talking about social media, how Twitter was phenomenal, and I was on a panel with debating somebody, and they said to the crowd, how many people think Twitter is stupid? And everybody raised their hand. Everybody. And the person interviewing me said, Gary, why is Twitter so important? And I said, because people are gonna tweet that they're walking their dog. Everybody laughed. Not at it at me. The reporter rightfully said, that sounds ludicrous. Who cares if somebody's walking their dog? My reply, everyone. I suck at almost everything. It's true. It's, people are so confused how the world works. Everybody in this room pretty much sucks at almost everything, except a couple things. I suck at almost everything, but the one thing that has been with me since I was a child, when I listened to my late grandma's stories about me from zero to seven, or my mother's, it's very clear that DNA is a remarkably powerful thing. I suck at almost everything except one thing. I know you collectively as well as any person that works on earth. I understand people. I do, it comes to me, it's natural to me, and I'm so grateful for it because I have such deep wants for it to be good. I'm in such a good place and I want you to be in a good place.
my inbox now has, in the last seven years has gone from parents being mad at me and saying stop cursing, stop telling my kid not to go to college, <laughs> to in the last 24 months, you're the only person my kid's listening to, you're, you're actually pushing the agenda I want them to, please keep doing it, don't ever stop. Nice. And I think for every content. Well your content's changed a little bit too. Well it evolved, yeah. it changed because I was listening to the yeah, yeah. emails, I was like yeah. wait a minute, you know, and some of it was doubling down. When the parents were pushing, I'm like you're pushing for the wrong thing. You, it's very real and you'll feel this as you start to grow. Direct message number one. Hey Gary, like you're a real menace. Like stop doing this. You're like telling my kid not to go to college. Who the f do you think you are? Next DM. Hey Gary, my, I'm in deep depression. I'm now on a lot of medication and starting to use alcohol and drugs because my parents are making me go to Yale and I want to be an artist. You start reading that over and over and over again, you become more invigorated to say you. <laughs> you want to help these kids. Because then what, and by the way, I just painted you two, I didn't paint you the full diamond. Then the ninth message is, Gary, I have a problem. My kid is in big trouble, they hate me, and I think some of the stuff you're talking about might be why. I over pushed them to be an engineer, now they won't speak to me. Like, what do I do? So all of a sudden you're sitting in this place where you know you have gift of gab or communication skills, and by the way, I felt this 10 years ago when my audience was so small, nobody knew who the f I was. It doesn't take much to feel compelled when you're reading this stuff. My biggest concern is that I know there's a lot of people here who consume my content, leave comments, DM me, engage. They talk my talk, but they don't live my talk. I get more emails from people that are the employees of people who love me and talk about me all day to tell me that Rick loves you, I have no idea what you're talking about, but Rick's completely full of <laughs> He talks like you talk, he repeats your but he's a asshole. <laughs> that Rick story is super common. I know there's a ton of Ricks in this room right now, I know it more than the sun will come up tomorrow. You talk that Gary V you don't live that Gary V and where you don't live it is not on the hustle and grind. You don't live it on the kindness and humanity. You don't live it on the empathy and about that. 100%, 100%. And I don't say that on stage to come up here and like, I'm good and scolding you. I'm coming on stage saying, cut that shit out. I promise you, if you listen to this, it's real. It's real. The reason I pound patience down everyone's throat and everyone hates the flavor of it is because once you have a framework of patience, it eliminates so much bad behavior. Patience is important because most people can't see, like the way I set up this talk, can't see that most of the shit they do is for affirmation from other people. People can't see that most of the shit they do is to get credit from other people. Normally toxic relationships, whether parents, siblings, plus ones, or my favorite thing to hate, because I hate the word hate, but I hate this, so many of you live your life based on the comments from strangers on social media. People here don't post certain shit because they don't think it's gonna get enough likes. People post certain shit that they're not even about anymore because they think it's gonna get a bunch of likes. People are scared to make video content when they know video content works because they're scared the way they look and they don't want people to say they don't look good. The world runs on a currency of people trying to get affirmation from others. People buy shit they can't afford, do shit they don't want to do, all to impress people they don't even like. My wife really looks up to you because she struggles with mental health. What's her name? Her name is Abby. Abby? Do you mind if I take a video? I'm going to make a video. I will. Abby, I'm here with your amazing wife. We miss you. I can't wait to see you in person too. Come to VCon. Come to next card show. We need to say hello and hug. Love you. Keep going. It always gets better. Rolling camera. All right. So I know you collect a lot of cards. Would you do me a favor? 
and pick out your favorite three cards that you have with you today. Juan Soto, okay. Rookie Auto, Premium Card, 2700. Akeem Nine, still think one of the most underrated freight cards in the sport. And Jerry West, PSA 6, Rookie Card, the logo. All right, nice choices. Thank you. Ooh. I like that. <laughs> Call my attention. How much should I sell it for? Hold on to it. I'd hold on to it for a while. If you're willing to hold on for five years, hold on. I'm a musician, and I'm a data analyst, but I'm an extreme doctor. Why? I don't like data analysts. I don't like computer science in general. So don't do it. But the only problem is the visa status. Every day I wake up, it's, it's extreme pain. Well, then you should go back. Those are not the two worst options in the world. Yeah. You understand? Yeah, yeah. You're in extreme darkness because you don't have the perspective of understanding that that is not as bad as you think. I get it. I get it. It sucks yeah. to do something you don't like. Yeah. But you've got options. The amount of times I see kids like yourselves roll up on me and say, Gary, I'm going to buy the Chicago Bulls. You're gonna buy the Jets, I'm gonna buy the Bulls. And I can taste it in their sentence that they know they can't. The place where it really works is when you stop peacocking and posturing to yourself as a measure to make yourself feel better and bigger and actually are just comfortable with what you are, you get really into your state. This is what's so great about my life. You're a failure, you're gonna be a garbage man. And I was just like, I just like selling stuff. <laughs> you know. And I don't care that everybody thinks that I'm not a lawyer or a doctor or an executive, like I'm happy. And if that makes, you know, I was a pig and shit at 27 making 70,000 a year, pumped. Working every day at a liquor store, helping my family, like flows easy once you stop lying to yourself and, wa- and once you stop trying to impress others with the shit that comes out of your mouth. When you die, You'll be dead for a very long time. Are you sure? I'd love, listen, if this whole thing about souls go into, like I would love to come back as a little Danish girl. (laughs) Um, But yes, when you die, you will be dead for a long time. Also, I don't know if you know this, You were not born for a very long time. We have like, even though life is long and hopefully everybody here lives to at least 100, it's also, if you take a step up, very short. The concept of not squeezing the out of it from a happiness standpoint, from a trying standpoint, from an ambitious standpoint is ludicrous to me. And so I keep it super simple. Nobody died, best day ever. I mean it, I mean it. (sighs) To the negative people in my life, there's been some of my friends and family that are negative that there's two times in my life where I actually said this, I got so frustrated to a family member, so frustrated, so upset, I literally told them, because they were so upset about the dumbest in the world, I literally told them that I wished something atrocious happened to them the next day, just for perspective. We just lack perspective. Like, we complain about ludicrous things. I'd like to leave a mark, you know, why not? Why not try to, be an impactful human being, why not? And uh, I think the way I can do that is through my communication capabilities. And I think I penetrate people in a way that's unique. I I have come to realize that in in my 30s uh, and early 40s. And now I want to scale that because what I, the way I talk may work for you, but it may not work for your aunt or your niece and or for your buddy John and I think about that. I know as a matter of fact I'm quite aware that for 30% of people, 20% of people it's instant turn off instead mm. of the other way. A little too much, too aggressive. You know, people feel like my conviction and passion sometimes comes across as egotistical or as a know-it-all and I'm empathetic to that feedback. I respect it. 
I also know that is the furthest thing from my intent. And, um, and I'm incredibly passionate to develop these characters to continue my journey of pushing good human attributes. And that's what I'm going to do. What would you say to be the turning point in your life that kind of shifted to who you are today? And what could we take like from that? Like if there's any advice that you can give to us from something that's happened to you in your life that made you to who you are today? I don't think there's something super clear, brother. I think what the real answer to this question is something happened to me between nine and 14 that isn't very clear to me still that flipped me to a level of self-awareness and confidence that guided me my whole life. Like one thing that is very bonkers to me is how completely non-penetratable I was to peer pressure in high school. I still don't fully even understand it, to be honest. Like when I recall the things I didn't do in the face of why it would seemingly be so easy and so obvious that you should do that if you're a kid, good parenting, good DNA, circumstances. I do think there are some big advantages of growing up in the dirt, you know, um, but what I would tell you to give you an answer that maybe brings value is how quickly can you fall fully in love with yourself? Like that you're so in love with yourself that you don't need validation from anybody else. While you balance that love with, of yourself with extraordinary levels of humility to offset the vulnerability of loving yourself. Evan, thank you so much for having a couple seconds and being able to tell the Believe Nation a little bit about Empathy Wines. It means a lot to me that you would take this valuable real estate and, and time on your channel to give me some love. It means a lot. It's just good karma points and so you're just, you're awesome, thank you. Believe Nation, uh, if you're into wine at all, go to empathywines.com. My whole career's work was poured into producing a wine that rivaled 40 to $60 wine for 20 bucks a bottle. Uh, I'm just super excited about this subscription-based wine business. You can order three, six, or 12 bottles in subscription form, rosé, white, red. Um, if, you, if you search on Instagram or, or Twitter, you will be blown away. People are literally like, I don't even like Gary Vee, but the wine's good. Super proud of the effort. Thanks, Evan, for the time. Uh, wishing you guys all happy and healthy. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from me, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Finding your purpose is easy. Finding your purpose, finding your passion, finding what you're meant to do is easy. And I will beat this drum until everybody figures it out because it's one of the most common questions that I keep getting asked.